So, Ralph, I'm recording this now for YouTube, and uh, we'd like to talk about refactoring and how buildings learn and uh, big ball of mud. And, yeah, uh, so I, I, want, I wanted to talk about the, the paper big ball of mud. So okay. the, the story of this goes that we were reviewing the drafts of the book Pattern Oriented Software Architecture. And this is by a bunch of people at Siemens, a bunch of Germans from Siemens. And uh, my, my research group was every week we'd get together and we would read it and we took notes of our conversations and we would send back emails every week with our comments. Uh, we might have actually made MP3 recordings. It was a long time ago. I don't remember just how we did it then. Because for any case... I made a comment at one point that they, they, they were missing one of the central architectural patterns in software because they had a catalog of a lot of different uh, architectural patterns. And I said they were missing one of the most important architectural patterns, which was big ball of mud. And, of course, the students all laughed. They were right. This, is, this, is, yeah. this was a, a joke. And, and somebody put it in the notes and we sent it back to them. Well, they thought it was funny too. And in the book – they actually made some comment about Big Ball of Mud, and they cited me as if I had written this, pick, this pattern down. So if you look at, at Pattern-Oriented Software Architecture, you'll find a reference in there, a citation. You know, it's yeah. a Big Ball of Mud by Ralph Johnson. Now, of course, I, I never had written anything. Well, after that, Brian Foote started thinking, well, we really ought to write this because, yes, it really is something people do. It, and, and calling it an architectural style is, is sort of – Weird because most people think of this as just is just a horror story, and how do you and and so the question is why do so many systems end up this way? Yeah. And and so the the paper that they wrote tries to treat big ball of mud as like a serious architectural style, uh, even though you know nobody really does it on purpose. Um, and, and, and but they also, as I say, if you don't understand why systems end up this way, you won't know how to keep it from happening. There's reasons why systems tend to evolve towards lots of interconnectedness and not ha being able to. Uh, you, you change one part and it, and it ends up affecting lots of other parts. Yeah. And so so. The shearing layers is something you do to keep from having a big ball of mud. So they sort of go through and have these different patterns. Some of them are about like piecemeal growth. Okay, is let's, talk both. About, let's define shearing layers for people who are just coming in for the. Okay, well, well, there's if, if if you Google big ball of mud, you will find the paper. So I'm I'm sort of talking about this paper. Okay. okay. And they have the patterns: big ball of mud, throwaway code, piecemeal growth. Keep it working. Yeah. Shearing layers. Sweeping it under the rug. Okay. And reconstruction. <laughs> so these are the patterns that are the paper. And you know, big ball of mud is talking about a large system with lots of connectivity, where every part is like connected to every other part, and it's difficult to figure yeah. out how to change things. Yeah. When they say that one of the reasons that you get that. They often start as a small system. Now, every big system starts as a small system. Right. And, and the, 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 the successful big systems start as successful small systems. And often they start because you have throwaway code. People are writing things that they don't intend to keep. And in fact, most of the throwaway code we write really does get thrown away. But some of the thro throwaway code we write doesn't. It sticks around. You know, Ten years later, people are still using it, and it's grown. It's gotten, it's gotten yeah. way bigger. If it, if it's huge, you add to it, and there really wasn't. It wasn't designed to become big. It just sort of, it just sort of grows. So, so that's one thing that contributes to to big ball of mud. It's not all because there are some systems that start off as pretty well designed, and then as time goes on, they they, they lose their design. Yeah. The other is piecemeal growth. So piecemeal growth is that the system is growing, but the growth is not necessarily planned. And it tends to happen a bit at a time. Now, in fact, a lot of good systems grow with piecemeal growth. I think that, that piecemeal growth is a, a, a very natural way for things to grow. Uh, Christopher Alexander was the – so software engineers tend to use piecemeal growth as a 
bad word. They're saying that that you know, we want to avoid this piecemeal growth. We want to be more planned in how we do things. Yeah. Christopher Alexander is the first person I read who talked about piecemeal growth as being good. He said that when cities grew piecemeal, it was a lot better than when they grew with large, you know, big planned areas. He was opposed to central planning, and he thought piecemeal growth resulted in much better cities. So I, I thought that was pretty interesting because – the people who are into refactoring and extreme programming, we, we tend to like piecemeal growth too. But there wasn't much intellectual argument in favor of piecemeal growth uh, before. But the other side is piecemeal growth has a downside. It definitely has some problems. And that is you know, what happens when your architectural needs change because you've added all these features and so you start off with a small system and it didn't need a lot of architecture but now that it's gotten to be bigger it actually needs more architecture but you 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 don't have it it, it doesn't have it and so then the system is liable to become a big ball of mud okay. so another this is the next one so we have a big ball of mud throwaway code a piecemeal growth and uh, keep it working and keep it working is it's like the email that, that you sent about cities, how cities don't ever um, – I mean, they change, but you never throw away the old city and make a new one. Yeah, you, that was you, uh, Mascar's email, by the way. It wasn't me. Uh, okay. Mascar. Okay. Okay. Anyway, that is one of the, the keys, I think, to developing large software. You start small and, and you grow, but – People who take it all apart and then change everything and put it all back together again, uh, often it never works. <laughs> you know, this is just a, it's a very dangerous thing yeah. to, to say. And there, there's this famous case, I believe, of, of Mozilla where they spent like three years uh, trying to put it back together again. And it was a real crisis that just about ended the, the project. Yeah. Uh, very, very. They manage to survive, but there are other people who do stuff like that, and they don't survive. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's it's very dangerous. It's much better to make small changes. But the problem then is, how do you introduce architecture? If you start with a small system, you add a bunch of features, and now you need some sort of architectural thing. How do you? Uh, how do you add it? It's 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 different. So, so this sharing layers fits in very well. What it says is you try to separate your software into components where all the stuff that changes at the same time will be in, in the same place. Yeah. And that is a, a key refactoring principle. Yeah. And again, like I was saying to you before, refactoring doesn't say you have to have sharing layers or, or you have to have modules or anything. It's just that Shearing layers, modules, are ways we have of managing complexity. And so often, as your system is growing, what you often have to do is refactor it to put the structure in the system that, that wasn't there. Can we go back a bit on shearing layers and talk about uh, how it comes out of Stuart Brand's book, How Buildings yeah. Learn? And uh -huh. Describe that the, the layers there. Uh, he identifies six layers, the site, the structure, the skin, the services, the space plan, and the physical stuff in the building. And I'm reading from WIRFS-Brock.com on Agile Architecture. Okay. So that's an interesting model of, of having one you know, different levels of permanence or persistence in the well, architecture. Is, yeah, he's just saying this is true of buildings. So you think of any building, uh, so my house. I mean, we go through and we put new wallpaper or we paint or we do something like that. We do that a lot more frequently than we knock down walls. You know, knocking down walls is a big deal. Yeah. We, we have done that too. But, of course, we never walk – if we're going to knock down walls, we hire somebody else to do it. Uh, yeah. My brother-in-law would do it himself, uh, but uh, I, I won't do that. And um, – but we'll paint it ourselves. We'll put up new wallpaper. And, of course, moving furniture around. Well, yeah. some people move furniture around a lot. I, I have a I, – I know a couple where the wife likes to have the furniture changed every few months. She just 
you know, she, to go a whole year with the furniture in the same place really would annoy her. Yeah. And so every time we go over there, you know, things are, are in a different place. Yeah. Whereas in our family, we tend to look for the right place to put things, and then we have to put the Christmas. Now we have a problem with the Christmas. The Christmas tree doesn't fit, so it's Christmas time. We have to move stuff around for the Christmas tree. But we'll put the Christmas tree down. Things will go back to the correct place. Right. Um, so there's different styles. You know, Some people, even in the same kind of architecture, some people will change uh, things more than, than others will. So that's a shearing layer inside of the... Uh, uh one layer of the buildings. Uh, yeah, and so another another aspect of those like the foundation. You know, foundations right. are really, really hard to change. Right. So when we 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 owned our house for half a dozen years and we were trying to figure out whether we should move. And we looked at houses in other parts of town, but we liked our house, we liked our neighborhood. And so then we thought about adding on to put a master bedroom suite on. Right. And when we had the builder, the builder said, well, putting it over the garage is the natural thing. It would be really easy to fit it in, but it all depends on how good the foundation is because you've got to have a, a stronger foundation to put two stories and to put one, and we'll just have to check and see if they did it because if they didn't do it, then you, you just can't build the second story, but if yeah. they did build a good foundation, then you'll be in fine shape. So yeah. they went off, they did their study, they said, yep, the foundation is great, we can do it. And so there's a case where the foundation was a different shearing layer. That's sort of thing that's harder to change than, yeah. than just another layer of a building. Of course, adding that extra layer, that was a lot harder than changing the furniture or changing the, the carpeting and the yeah. And so we build our our buildings. We can sort of see a building as these different layers of <clears throat> of things. And of course, I think they said the site yeah. across the street from us. We had an empty lot for many many years, and then one day they brought a building down on rollers or on whatever, and they plopped. Mm -hmm. they, they built a they built a basement. And they set the building down right over the basement, and they actually moved a building from, I don't know, yeah. wasn't all that far away. So you actually can change the site of a building, but it's, it's a really, really big deal. So getting back to software, uh, the sharing layer on a software project could be a new way of essentially rearranging the furniture on an existing uh, uh, that would be a, yeah. that'd be a new shearing. You can introduce a new shearing layer. Well, yeah. that's that's one of my ideas is to introduce a semantic overlay to the existing Vista foundation. So mm -hmm. uh, I had this whole notion of a universal namespace, so every object in the system would have a unique name, and the idea of then overlaying the RDF uh, semantic web type of thinking on top of that, and allowing the semantic web technology and, and link data cloud te technology to overlay on top of the data dictionary. So it's really mm -hmm. just a thin layer between the data dictionary and the rest of the world. And that mm -hmm. opens it up to RDF and OWL and Sparkle queries and the notion of having a directed graph for the, the, the entire patient database, uh, which to me sounds like a really neat new layer to play with. The other advantage to that is that you could carry on the semantics of the patient privacy. So as you're exposing the patient database, you'd have the existing security structure that would then just propagate into the interface, and you wouldn't have to reinvent a security system uh, for exposing the data. Uh, and if you control the query processor, the Sparkle query processor, you could even do smarter things like saying, well, this guy is querying things that could identify this patient. Uh, because he's asking for things that are so unique that he's going to be able to identify the patient. So the query processor itself could fuzz up the, the, the query and say, no, you can't ask for people with this disease and this zip code, but you could get this disease in Illinois. Uh, so you'd fuzz up the, the zip code into all of Illinois and um, allow intelligently a researcher to be able to query at a, at a broader level. Yeah. But anyway, but, that's just one idea I had. Yeah, so so backing up, I think that 
over the years, Vista has tended to become a big ball of mud. This is, it's natural. It's basically what happens to all systems, and especially because for the past, say, 15 years or so, Vista really has not had any architectural leadership. Right. And so it's sort of been left to all the various people working on it to, like, do the best they can in there. So you've, you've had piecemeal growth. You've had keep it working. But people have not introduced new shearing layers. Okay. And they, okay. So we're right? I mean, back- see, that, that's just sort of what's been happening with, with Vista. Now, okay. now, there's people out there now who are looking at trying to better define the interfaces between modules okay. and to break unnecessary linkages between modules, decouple them more. Okay. So this is sort of a, a low-level type of shearing layer. Yeah. You're talking about a higher-level shearing layer. You're putting something on top. Yeah. but Part of to do that, you want to like move things out. Now, you and I have talked about another kind of shearing layer, uh, which is the fact that there's a lot of metadata yeah, uh, that yeah. gets used for uh, defining a screen or defining a medical procedure or something like that. Yeah. And that yeah. there's there's stuff that you could do with code, but instead gets done with data. And that you've said, well, there's more places that ought to be like that. There's a sort of commonality. Uh, now, there would be a case where you would you'd make a system for, for manipulating this metadata, and then you'd have to go through Vista, the different applications of Vista, and for each one, you would have to like, rewrite them to use this, this better way of doing things. Okay. But it would end up becoming another shearing layer as well. So it's more of the uh, functional level. In other words, we need to exchange this thing from here to there with this payload. Is that kind of what you're talking about? A, a specific interface of lab data from one place to another? Is that the layer that you're talking about? Um, I'm not. I'm not sure. Well, uh, so, so you talked before about. Uh, for example, things have state, and then their state changes over time. Right. And and you know I know lots of ways of coding that up, but what you had said was that I've got a list someplace of these different. But but one of them I remember was managing state. It's kind of like yeah. a workflow type of state because as yeah. as the state of this thing changes over time, you can do different things with yeah. it, and that there should be a more systematic way of dealing with that. Yeah, and I then call, you, there I could be that. some some metadata. Yeah, I call that the pendex, the pending index of, of everything that's anticipated oh. in the system. And okay. extracting the state out of the applications into this higher level state manager. Yeah, okay. So so uh, so pen, pendex is is your name for that. Yeah. Uh, but but the point is that that would be another kind of sharing layer. A temporal that, one with temporal semantics attached to it, not just static data semantics. It's not a stateless protocol anymore. It's statefulness. It's managing. Yeah, state. well, well, a lot of, of shearing, la- shearing layers can be could have have states. I mean, they, they don't have to, but they they can. Okay. And there's a question of figuring out then how to, how you design. You know, what's the purpose of the shearing layer? And yeah. I, I said, you, you, so so shearing people that they think of a shearing layer, they might think of. Uh, like layered architecture, software layers. It doesn't have to be the same thing. Because if you look at a building, we say we've got the site, and then we've got the foundation or the structure. You've got the walls. There's the, uh, there's the, I don't call them the decoration on the walls, but you know the stuff like the paint and the the carpet. But you also then have the furniture. And you don't think of the furniture as a separate layer from... The carpet, yeah. You know, these somehow these seem different, but when you start thinking of it as shearing layers, as these are the things that, that change, yeah. uh, it actually helps you understand the whole system better. It's, a, it's a, a a way of organizing our knowledge about buildings. I like it. I, I think I think it's a really uh, uh, insightful way of looking at at architectures and their evolution and. Uh, this whole notion of clump, clumping together things as they, according to their 
how long they live, you know. Uh, yep. that's, a, yep. that's a really neat perspective. Well, that was easy for me to understand because that is one of the heuristics for refactoring that when you see things that change together, you try to put them together. It's like a, it's an object design yeah. heuristic. Um, and, and there are two ways of talking about the change. One is how do programmers change the things? So you think of, I've got a task. I'm supposed to add a feature. I'm supposed to, I go in, and then what parts of the system do I have to modify? You'd like... If the system is cohesive, then typically the different parts you have to modify will all be close together. Whereas if it's not very cohesive, then you have to change all these different parts of the system all over. Yeah. I, I so, have, uh, uh, so that's one way. But in other ways, when you just look at how the system executes. Um, Didn't have a what? I'm sorry? When you watch the system execute, okay. uh, do you, are you having data locality? Is the data tend to be close together? Okay. And if you're doing like performance analysis and trying to make the system go faster, uh, but it turns out also uh, from analyzing security or analyzing reliability, it works better if, if data tends to be together when it's being changed. So... Yeah, I, I think there's some really fascinating issues there with the VA in particular with big data. And, mm -hmm. if, for example, if the VA does its um, million veterans program with genomics, that's about a 10 petabyte database. If they do the full genome on a million patients, mm -hmm. and now what do you do? Uh, you know, that's a heck of a lot of data to be thrashing around. A petabyte? 10 petabytes. Uh, in, in the context of clinical data, which is, you know, 30 years of 6 million patients or whatever, I don't know the numbers, but uh, it's a huge, huge uh, database. And the idea of putting that out on a grid computing structure where the VA has 300,000 uh, PCs out there. So if you stage the data into work units that are kind of local to their medical records, and then you just turn on a parallel search of 300,000 uh, PCs looking at a chunk of the genome and a chunk of the medical record, and you do this huge map-reduce type thing, and overnight you can do uh, 3 million hours of computer searching. Uh, anyway, that's a pretty interesting architecture to play with, and it's just uh, basically free, and you know, just the cost of electricity to run these computers all night. That's a mm -hmm. whole other layer we can talk about. But uh, okay, let's go back to your your shearing layer. Have you finished with the shearing layers? Do you want to go to sweeping it under the rug, or? Oh well, the question is, how do you deal with with complexity when you can't really break it into shearing layers? And there's sort of two different uh, possibilities here. Uh, the sweeping it under the rug is you basically you 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 build a boundary around it, and maybe inside the boundary things are pretty complicated, but you can just Look at it from the outside, and you don't have to worry about how complicated it is. Yeah. Um, I, that's 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 basically what sweeping it under the rug means. Yeah, I, I, that's, this is a really interesting way of looking at things. I guess I haven't been so formalized in my thinking. I used to call it a a, a bowl of spaghetti. And, yeah. Uh, you know, you start out with simple stuff, and the spaghetti keeps piling on. Um, yeah. But, but I think there's some lessons learned there. I. I, I Brian would, Foot likes spaghetti too. He's got that great picture of it. Okay. Um, <laughs> the uh, the big ball of mud. Well, anyway, I, I guess I, I would have added a, a a chapter or a pattern. I, I hesitate to call it a pattern, but I call it creating a path of least resistance. And so, for example, we started out with a a date routine that was Y two K compatible, mm -hmm. nineteen seventy eight. And it was just easier to do it that way. You know, it was just easier to be compatible. You didn't have to invent your own date formats. And, you know, people could get, get on other people for using incompatible dates. But by and large, by making it easier to use a compatible date, um, it would go there. And I guess another pattern I would put on there is charm or something that is attractive beauty that people would just naturally do it in this this way that it would be a charming way to, to make your code beautiful 
and uh-huh. Vista lost its charm. You know, it, it, it wasn't charming to do it this way anymore, and the, the beauty that I saw in the original uh, architecture was was pretty much buried in the geek's world, and, and it, it, it's lost the, the, this feature of charm that would say, okay, yeah, let's do it this way. Let's make it a beautiful interface. And uh-huh. so that that kind of, you know, losing its charm or maybe deflowering would be another word for it. But um, Well, I think part of it is lack of architectural vision. What happens is people who had this clear vision of what it was supposed to do left, and you had a bunch of mechanics who took care of it, and they were trying the best they could, but they... You know, they weren't. They were had different personalities, perhaps. Yeah. Or just different motivations. Well, and they're also, you know, next Tuesday we have to have this thing working, and uh, yep. So if you're under the gun for that specific stovepipe to do that specific thing, and if you don't, you're going to get fired. Uh, you're not going to think the big thoughts about building a tool to do this, rather than just do it as a, another instance. So I think that's one of the things that really got lost. It was the tool building. Uh, yeah. went, Vista went to central office, and I, I attribute this transition to the centralization of DHCP. When it was in the field, we had intense um, mailing list discussions about centralization and decentralization, and and how do you manage this the ball of mud? And it was a really hot topic. I have I have some of the listings around here, and I'm it's kind of amazing to see what we were arguing about back then. But I think even in the decentralized uh, you know, the bazaar rather than the cathedral model of, of interaction. I think that the original DHCP did have a certain level of self-management on this. Uh, and it, it wasn't the, the helter-skelter development that the centralists have feared. And I, 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 I have to wonder if the helter-skelter state or the ball of mud we have today has actually been caused by the efforts to centralize it and apply the, the cathedral model of development. Uh, I, I would say it's more not so much uh, centralized as command and control. So you could have centralized where okay. you have a visionary at the top who who then communicates that vision to everybody else and that he knows because there's a hundred people down below that you can't he can't go to everybody every day and watch what they're doing and tell them exactly what they ought to do but so how can he influence them well he he, he, he inspires them that's that's yeah. if you're an architect of a large project yes you can do your architectural diagrams and all but still you're basically your job is to inspire people and, and yeah. you tell them what's important to focus on yeah. and when you look at successful projects like that that's how the leadership will work but too often people think no I write the specs and everybody else will go off and implement them yeah and, and they don't think about it as inspiring they really do think about it much more as controlling and you can't control you know something you just can't really control so when when people try to do this this centralized top-down thing in a in a control-oriented way, they they they'll, they'll they'll fail. Yeah. Well, I so guess... so I, I get I think it's a little bit too simple to say because there are these successful top-down systems. A, a major problem with Vista was it it was originally this bottom-up, very decentralized thing, and shifting from one to the other is was horrible. Uh, you know, um, uh, Conway's law. Have you heard of Conway's law? So Conway's law is that the architecture of a system is the same as the structure of the group that made it. Right. Okay, you know so okay. what happened was you've got this system that for better or worse, I mean, you can say, you can like it, you can not like it, but it was yeah. definitely done by a decentralized group. And so you end up with sort of a decentralized architecture. And now we can say, well, we're going to completely shift the way we develop the software yeah. And that means, you know, that, that now this new way of developing the software is not going to match the architecture. Yeah. So Well I I, I you, you make the other argument, people the, the Vista people make the other argument. There's there's been a whole group of companies that have tried to develop from scratch 
medical information systems in a top-down, very structured, centralized way, and none of them have been nearly as good as Vista. So, in fact, maybe this architecture is the right one. It, it really is a better way to develop this type of software. Um, so I, I'm just saying I've heard that argument. I don't know enough to to judge, but yeah. what I would say is that if you take a system – that's developed in one particular style and it has an architecture that matches that style. And then you say, we're going to completely change the organization of our development. Yeah. You're, you're just asking for trouble, right? It's, yeah. it's almost guaranteed to have problems. Well, this is exactly what DOD did with Alta. They, you know, CHES was too flexible and they made this mega centralized, you know, one data center for everything. And, to me, it looked like one single point of failure, and it turned out that way. And it was, you know, four or five billion dollar uh, write-off, as far as I'm concerned. Um, the other thing, uh, probably, is a whole other discussion, but that is with scale. How, to, you know, and one of the foundational features, the sharing layer that Vista already has, is very large scale. So it, you know, it does, you know, hundreds of thousands of users and umpteen percent of the current healthcare. Uh, electronic record systems uh -huh. and scale has always been a part of the design and um, I think that's unique I don't no one else has ever done an EHR system of the scale that that Vista did mm -hmm. and uh, I, I went through what I call scale shock when I was designing it but when we I was used to using you know 24 30 terminals on a PDP 11 and suddenly I found out we were buying 12,000 terminals in the VA, and I just couldn't imagine a system with 12,000 terminals. And, it, you know, of course, today that's, that's nothing, but, um, uh -huh. but the, the, the idea of, of how do you scale up from, from this is, is really critical. And I guess yeah. another lesson there is Tim Berners-Lee and the web. The web obviously scaled. Uh, as HTTP, HTML, and URLs, and it didn't turn into a ball of spaghetti. It, it was kind of self-simplifying. All these chaotic URLs started appearing, and then Google appeared to bring them back together into a simple... Uh, Maybe right, people were, people were actually pretty worried for a while about how are you going to find stuff. And yeah. the first yeah. indexes that were made were, were basically done by hand, and I remember a number of different... Uh, indexes, and then it w Google was not the first. Oh, I used Alta not, Vista. Yeah. I used Alta Vista Alta for Vista, a couple yeah. of years before the Google came out. But clearly, the Google approach, or, or the, the, the 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 Web Spire collecting giant database and then doing searches against it, was a lot better than the let's make a manual index approach. Yeah, yeah. but we didn't know that in the beginning. You know, it was only something that we discovered after the fact. So the space discovered itself into existence. The sharing layer, Google could be looked at as a sharing layer, an associative layer on top of the web. It wasn't content, it was meta content, metadata. And Google emerged out of a need in the space for this to happen. So mm -hmm. if Tim had gone and said, well, I'm going to invent Google, you know, instead of inventing this chaotic mess, uh, we would never would have gotten there. So... Um, I call it design from a state of connectivity that might be another pattern there, is that we need to have a connectivity from which to express these levels of complexities and these new layers. But you can't just build layers in space. You have to have a, a, a linguistic framework for the layers to operate on. And to me, that's the most critical missing element in the day's architecture is just this notion of a universal namespace. So at least you know what we're talking about. And we have a universal way of referring to it. And that's my criticism of the whole NHIN project, the National Health Network. There's no names for stuff. We don't have a way of naming like a URI or URL per, per entity. So to uh, me, that's I'm, not going to scale. Afraid, I'm afraid I have to go. Okay, that sounds uh, good. I'm going to turn off the recorder now. So. Okay.